century saw a break from establishing new colonies because of the Civil War in England, during which Charles I was beheaded and England was ruled by Oliver Cromwell as Lord Protector. In 1660, the monarchy was restored and the executed king's son, now Charles II, took the reins of government. The colonies created under his rule were dubbed the Restoration Colonies. Established as one colony, Carolina, and governed by proprietors, the southern part of this established colony served first as support for the British West Indies. Soon, though, the slave economy of the Sugar Islands reached the shores of the Carolina colony. The cultivation of rice in the plantation system quickly became profitable, and planters in the hundreds and slaves in the tens of thousands soon inhabited Carolina. The geography of the area was particularly suited to plantation agriculture, with broad plains and easily navigable rivers extending deep into the Piedmont. At the heart of the colony was the merchant port of Charlestown, established in 1669, later to be known as Charleston. African slaves would become a majority of the population before the middle of the 18th century. Such was not the case for the northern reaches of the Carolina colony. The earliest inhabitants of this region were primarily displaced former indentured servants drifting southward from the Chesapeake. Most established small tobacco farms, and though river transportation was possible, it was not as conducive to the establishment of large plantations. Slavery did exist here, but in far smaller numbers than in the neighboring regions. The inhabitants of the northern part of the Carolina colony felt as if the aristocrats from Virginia and the Charleston area looked down their noses on them. North Carolina, like Rhode Island in the north, would ultimately draw the region's discontented masses. As the two locales evolved separately and as their differing geographies and inhabitants steered contrasting courses, calls for a formal split emerged. In 1712, North Carolina and South Carolina became distinct colonies. Each prospered in its own right, particularly after this peaceful divorce took effect. Georgia would be the last colony to be established, not until 1733, and its purpose was twofold. First, it was to be a buffer between Spanish Florida and the wealthier Carolina colonies to the north. This was especially important as England had been through two wars against Spain and wanted to prevent the ravages on their people. A second purpose was to provide opportunities for England's poor, especially those who languished in debtors' prisons. By removing them from custody, they would no longer be a drain on the nation's coffers, and they could serve the purpose of defending the wealthier colonies to the north from Spanish and native attacks. Returning northward brings us to the middle colonies. These were actually the most diverse of all of the English colonies. European ethnic groups, including the English, the Swedes, the Dutch, the Germans, the Scot-Irish, the French, and the Finns, lived in closer proximity here than in any location in continental Europe. The middle colonies contained Native American tribes of Algonquin and Iroquois language groups, as well as a sizable percentage of African slaves during the early years. Unlike solidly Puritan New England, the middle colonies presented an assortment of religions. The presence of Quakers, Mennonites, Lutherans, Dutch Calvinists, and Presbyterians made the dominance of one faith next to impossible. Given a tremendous advantage by their central location, the middle colonies would serve as an important distribution center in the English mercantile system. New York and Philadelphia would grow at a fantastic rate, and these cities gave rise to brilliant thinkers like Benjamin Franklin, who had the respect of both sides of the Atlantic. In many ways, the middle colonies would serve as the crossroads of ideas during this colonial period. In contrast to the South, where the cash crop and plantation system dominated, and New England, whose rocky soil made large-scale agriculture difficult, the middle colonies were fertile. This was America's breadbasket at the time. Land was generally acquired more easily than in New England or in the plantation south, and wheat and corn from local farms would feed the American colonies throughout their colonial infancy. The middle colonies represented exactly that, a middle ground between its neighbors to the north and the south. Elements of both New England towns and sprawling country estates could be found. Religious dissidents from all regions could settle in a relatively tolerant middle zone. Aspects of New England shipbuilding and lumbering, as well as the large farms of the South, also existed. And so this was the perfect nucleus for English America. The land, 
that was initially explored by Henry Hudson in 1609 would represent the area where the Dutch would initially settle, and that would become the colony of New Netherland, eventually becoming New York. It was actually established and settled in 1623 by the Dutch West India Company, who hoped to reap profits from the area's fur trade. Shortly after setting up camp, Peter Minuit made perhaps one of the greatest real estate purchases in history, trading various trinkets with local Native Americans for the purchase of Manhattan Island, which is where present-day New York City is. The town that was established there at the time was named New Amsterdam. There were no elements of democracy in the colony, and land was distributed much like feudal holdings, so the disparity of wealth between rich and poor was tremendous. Slavery was also very common, as the Dutch West India Company was one of the most prominent in the world's trade of slaves. Now, after Charles II came to the throne, the English became very interested in Dutch holdings in the New World, and in 1664, he granted the land to his brother, the Duke of York, which was interesting because technically England did not own New Netherland yet. But when a powerful English military unit appeared off the coast of New Amsterdam, the governor was forced to surrender and New Netherland became the property of the English crown and was renamed New York to be administered by the Duke of York, the future James II. New Jersey was also initially part of the Dutch claim. Small trading colonies had sprung up where the present towns of Hoboken and Jersey City were located. The Dutch, the Swedes, and the Finns were some of the first European settlers in the region. In 1664, the Dutch lost control of the New Netherlands when Britain took control of the land and added it to their colonies. The land that would become New Jersey was divided in half and given to the control of two proprietors, Sir George Carteret, who was in charge of the east side, and Lord John Berkeley, who was in charge of the west side. They named the area New Jersey after the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel near where they were from. They sold land at low prices and allowed settlers to have political and religious freedom. As a result, New Jersey, like New York, was more ethnically diverse than many of the other colonies. But it was primarily a rural society. Still, though, by the age of the Revolution, it had grown to more than 100,000 people. Eventually, governing power would be transferred back to the English crown, and for many years, New Jersey would share a royal governor with New York, although it had a separate legislature. In 1738, New Jersey would formally get its own governor and officially be split off from New York. As for Pennsylvania, it came about because William Penn's father was owed a tremendous debt by King Charles II. Normally, debts of this sort could be paid by high government office, which came with a salary. But Penn was equated by law from holding office in England. So to repay the Penns, William Penn was awarded an enormous tract of land in the New World, much like the Calvert family had been done with Maryland. Immediately, he saw the possibilities. As people of his faith, the Quakers, had suffered serious persecution in England. With some good advertising, he might be able to establish a religious refuge and maybe even turn a profit. His colony of Penn's Woods, or Pennsylvania, was officially established in 1681, and the Quakers, like their counterparts across the river in New Jersey, established an extremely liberal government for the 17th century. There was religious freedom, and there was no tax-supported church. Penn also insisted on developing good relations with Native Americans. Women saw greater freedom in Quaker society than elsewhere as they were allowed to participate fully in Quaker meetings. His colony was well advertised throughout Europe and skilled artisans and farmers flocked to the new colony. With Philadelphia as its capital, Pennsylvania soon became the keystone of the American colonies. The remnants of New Sweden, now called Delaware, also fell under the influence of Penn and the Society of Friends, as the Quakers were officially known. Though he controlled both, Penn governed them mostly separately. They had different legislatures, although they did share a governor. Pennsylvania would flourish as an agricultural center that also did have access to good ports, while Delaware focused primarily on commerce, with fishing being their dominant industry. 
because, of course, they had a much more coastal location. But remember, the colonists had arrived into a world where people already lived. When the British set foot on the North American continent at Jamestown, they encountered the Powhatan Indians. The Pequots and the Narragansetts lived in New England, as the Pilgrims and the Puritan established their new homes there. As the first group to encounter the English, these Algonquin cultural groups became the first to illustrate the deep misunderstandings between British settlers and Native Americans. For example, British Americans tended to think that Algonquin women were oppressed because of their work in the fields. Algonquin men laughed at the British men who farmed, which was traditionally work reserved for females in their society. Hunting was a sport in England, so British settlers thought that Algonquin hunters were unproductive and lazy. Natives didn't build and accumulate furniture or permanent housing. They didn't tend to animals. They didn't have beds or linens. They displayed their bodies, favoring nudity and animal skins over proper English clothing, as the settlers saw it. They referred to bodily functions matter-of-factly, as opposed to disguising them or not speaking of them. They didn't swaddle their babies and allowed their toddlers to run around naked. They had a habit of frequent bathing and exposing their nude bodies directly to the air and water and to the view of others, which was completely unacceptable in Puritan society. As graceful, healthy, and attractive people, as they likely were, they were seen as a serious threat to the morals and piety of the Puritan community. But perhaps the greatest misunderstanding was that of land ownership. In the minds of the Algonquins, selling land was like selling air. You simply couldn't do it. Eventually, this confusion would lead to armed conflict. 